hey, everybody, since there's a small group, I would encourage you to come up because we can make this like a nice informal uh, dialogue. Um, or stay where you're seated if you, if you want, but you know, it's just some, some lawyers and non-lawyers getting down about an amendment. Um, so my name is Brian Boyle. I serve as the Senior Legal Counsel for American Promise. Uh, I'm joined today with uh, Julie Brogan who is um, a volunteer, one of our extraordinary legal volunteers, and she's a retired attorney, um, and she also serves on our finance committee. And part of, we sort of had a three-part mission for today's breakout session. Um, one is to just take a step back and trace the history a little bit of how this legal problem started and how it got to the point, the crisis point that it is at today. Um, then we're gonna turn to actually look at the language of the 4R Freedom Amendment itself and, and, and show how specific pieces of that text are intended to address some of the components of, of the problems that you'll see illustrated in the cases. And then lastly, we wanted to um, talk a, a little bit about the legal network that we're trying to build up and uh, sort of hear your ideas about how we could make it stronger and tell you some of the things that we had in mind for future plans. Um, feel free, since we're a small enough group, if, if you want me to, if you want us to slow down or if you have a question, I don't know, are, how, if you're a lawyer, raise your hand. Yeah, so there's some lawyers, some non-lawyers, which is awesome. Um, so we'll just dive right in. Okay, so the legal problem, uh, the, the story that we're gonna tell today goes back five decades um, to Buckley versus Vallejo. And that case was really one of the first ones to, to explore the question of who should be able to regulate campaign finance. And I was actually thinking about what Colonel Wilkerson said this morning, and it's not just like who, sh who should have the power to regulate campaign finance, it's who should be empowered with the variety of tools that we need to protect our elections and to protect our, our form of self-government. And um, through a series of decisions, the Supreme Court has really positioned itself as the decision maker in this, in this realm, um, but it didn't have to be that way. And um, I don't know if you all have with you the little pocket constitution that you all received, but if you turn to page 14, Article 1, Section 4, and if you were somebody that didn't know a thing about campaign finance jurisprudence, you would look through the constitution and you say, oh, actually it looks like you know, there's a provision in here that gives power to the states and to Congress to control the time, place, and manner of holding elections. And that would seem to include maybe campaign finance regulations. Um, then comes along Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976. And Buckley basically says, listen, nobody here is challenging the idea that Congress has the ability to regulate federal elections. Uh, but the question that we think is critically presented is whether uh, really the First Amendment imposes certain limits on campaign finance. So it's, I think it's a fair question to ask, um, and I would agree with the first statement that you see up here, which is that campaign finance regulations do operate in an area of core First Amendment concern because it does touch on the marketplace of ideas. There's no question that um, money can help facilitate speech that we want, and that's important to run our country. Um, but where Buckley sort of took a very critical early turn was it imported into the into its view of the First Amendment, this idea that um, if the people, if state governments, if the federal government wanted to try to do things to equalize opportunities so that money wasn't just directly purchasing political power, uh, Buckley basically said, no, you can't do that. The idea that you can, no, they say restrict the speech, it's actually restrict the money. Um, they say restricting the money in order to enhance the relative voice of others is verboten by the First Amendment. So that was kind of the, the first seed that has spawned all the cases since. Um, just wanted to note, uh, an early dissenter kind of made a point which was that it's curious that the Supreme Court is putting itself in the position of making these types of discrete policy decisions because uh, Buckley was dealing with the, the Federal Election Campaign Act, um, which was passed by Congress, signed by the president, and 
And Justice White is saying, like, shouldn't, shouldn't we at least have some level of deference to the reasonable re regulations that our political actors have, have uh, thought would be wise? Um, but the court said no. And Buckley really set the parameters for the next 50 years. And so I just wanted to quickly touch on what I think are kind of the five key pieces uh, that go back to 1976. You know, first they say that spending money is protected by the First Amendment. Then they, they uh, apply sort of a, a almost strict or exacting scrutiny, which is basically uh, them saying, if there's a campaign finance regulation, we're not just going to ask whether it's reasonable, maybe defer to the political branches. We're going to really scrutinize it, and we're going to ask whether it's like closely drawn to, uh, and justified by what they consider sufficiently important interest. Um, then on top of that, they basically reject all other possible justifying interests other than uh, what they call corruption, quid pro quo corruption or its appearance. So they reject political equality, our interest in political equality as a justifying interest, or just the idea of fair play. Those are all, um, those are all out the window as potential justifying interests for campaign finance regulation. And then um, lastly, they, they do something um, which has also really had carry on effects, which is they allow for contribution limits. So just think about contribution. I, I give, you know, 500 bucks to Congressman La Police. Um, so that can be limited. Congress and the states can limit contributions, but they can't limit what they call expenditures. So if I just independently decide that I want to take out a gazillion newspaper ads, sort of like a Tom Steyer might do, those are if they're not coordinated, they're considered independent expenditures, and, and the court said the First Amendment doesn't allow for any regulation of that. Um, and so then we were off to the races. I'll, I'll zoom through these pretty quickly, but um, Bilotti was one of the early cases to look at corporate free speech rights, and um, here the court introduces this idea that uh, it's not, we're not so concerned about who is uh, is spending money to speak. It's just the ideas themselves that we care about. And so we're not going to really worry about whether um, mass accumulations of, of financial power are um, distorting the marketplace of ideas in an election. And interestingly, at that time, they said uh, they made a factual claim, which is that there's been no showing that uh, by allowing for corporations to spend money, in this case it was a, a citizens initiative in Massachusetts, they said there's been no showing that that's gonna threaten confidence of citizens in government. Um, and I think clearly that was a prediction that hasn't panned out. Um, Justice Rehnquist, who was not Chief Justice at the time, was a pretty strong dissenter his whole life actually uh, on the point of corporate speech. Um, and he, uh, this is just, one quote from his dissent, but he really strongly believed that because corporations are fundamentally different from natural persons, they're, they're creatures of the law that serve certain purposes, that it was reasonable and a long tradition of states and, and Congress having different rules for non-human speakers, um, but he was outvoted. Um, zooming ahead a little bit, I wanted to weave in Randall versus Sorrell, which is um, out of Vermont, because this is one of the many cases that shows that it's not just the Supreme Court usurping power from Congress, but also really taking off the table um, the types of strategies that individual states could use um, to fight the problem of corruption. Um, in this case, it was Vermont had certain expenditure limits that that their legislature and the people of Vermont felt would be in the best interests of their self-government. And um, the court, this was a Justice Breyer opinion, said, like, Buckley is the law of the land, uh, stare decisis. And so they, they had to overrule those, those limits. Um, Justice Stevens, who also dissented in Citizens United, um, is pointing sort of what I said at the beginning, which is that the First Amendment, if you're just looking at the text of it, doesn't really seem to even directly touch on uh, campaign finance. But yet, at this point in 2006, the court is very aggressively wielding it um, to really 
instantiate a, a completely, I guess you would say almost like laissez-faire view of how money in politics should function. Um, I won't, I won't, Justice Souter, uh, tried and true, very worried even in 2007 about um, the responsiveness of law to citizens and feeling that people are really starting to lose confidence in their government because they can tell that the game is rigged. Um, Davis versus FEC, where what was happening here is there was a provision in um, the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act, which tried to um, deal with the potential disproportionate advantage of really wealthy self-funders. And um, they allowed for, if you were dealing with a really wealthy self-funder, it raised the contribution limits for a challenger, um, which if you think about it is under the court's theory, potentially increasing the speech by allowing for more expenditures, but they struck that down and they said that it was, it was penalizing um, the wealthy self-funders. I think these quotes showed up in Jeff's remarks this morning, um, a bare assertion by the court that the electorate isn't gonna lose faith in democracy um, based on the appearance of influence or access. Um, and then finally, McCutcheon, one of the most recent ones um, where this is Justice Chief Justice Roberts, who's not just saying that ingratiation and access aren't corruption, he's saying like ingratiation and access in his view are a mode of responsiveness. I do just wanna point out one thing. So he says they embody a central feature of democracy that constituents support candidates. But as we talked about, a lot of the money is not coming from constituents. A lot of the money that's flowing in this, in this environment uh, maybe either from out of state or in some cases out of the country. So um, I actually wanted to invite Julie in to the conversation a little bit because you spent, well, tell folks what you did last year. So I just wanted to point out that while the Supreme Court over the past 50 years has been going in this direction, the rest of the world has been going in the opposite direction and developing more robust campaign finance regulations. And so I wanted to compare the, what I think is the most jarring language from McCutcheon, that a level playing field is not an objective for the government. Versus international guidelines, I think chapter two of the UN's guidelines on democratic elections is called leveling the playing field. <laughs> it's just generally accepted and very baked in to every emerging democracy and established democracy's laws. What we have on the, on the right is the handbook that election observers take to them in emergency emergent democracies in Europe. I'm thinking of Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union. And lawyers will go in and they'll examine the election laws. And one of the things they ask these lawyers to look for, and they could be lawyers from the United States, is a requirement that there is a balance, that they have reasonable limitations in order to not distort the dialogue. So regulation is generally accepted because it is baked in that they believe there is distortion when you spend too much money on one side. So Not on behalf of the United States, on behalf of, of international non-governmental organizations. Yeah, yeah. So the next slide, um, I had the uh, wonderful opportunity to live last year in France. And so I was there during the presidential election. And it was very refreshing to see an election where billions of dollars were not spent. And I'd like to compare the limit. Uh, so France has the most stringent campaign fin finance regulations in Europe. And presidential candidates in France can spend no more than 22 million euros. Let that sink in, because we've been talking today about the minimum entry for a Senate race in the United States is 200 million. So $22 million, it's about roughly $25 million. Um, 
is all that they can spend. And the laws are strictly enforced. This is not Emmanuel Macron who won the election. This is Nicolas Sarkozy who ran in 2014. He had a lot of corruption scandals, but kind of a la Al Capone, they got him on campaign finance. And he is now under house arrest in France. He was prosecuted and convicted for spending too much money on his campaign. He went over that limit. So they enforce the limits. They have great disclosure laws. And I want you to look at the top of this slide, and you see these values in the French Republic, which are on every public building in France. Liberté, égalité, and fraternité. Very similar to the Enlightenment values that founded the United States of America. Liberty and equality, I'd like to say with a little dose of e pluribus pluribus unum, but I yep. think we could use a little more fraternity in this country. But um, these are based on a document which is the equivalent, roughly, of our Bill of Rights, called the Declaration of the Rights of Man. And Article um, 10 of the Declaration of the Rights of Man is equivalent, not exactly the same, as our First Amendment. And so my point in comparing the United States to France is France is a free country. The um, slide on your right is the Gilets Jaunes demonstrations against Macron's economic policies. That is a free country. That is, that is not the kind of demonstrations that you're seeing in Iran and the Soviet Union, I mean in Russia right now, where people are being arrested for speaking out against the government. It is a free country. They have free speech. So, Free speech is not threatened by these campaign finance regulations. I don't think we need to revise the First Amendment. We certainly don't want to do that. I think the First Amendment is actually stronger than Article 10. But this new amendment would just put us where the rest of the world is. It would allow us to have a balance between the equality of voices and the liberty of speech. And uh, before we get to the constitutional fix, I, I just want to say I know a lot of people shorthand what American Promise is doing as like overturning Citizens United. And if there's one thing you take away from the first part of this presentation is that um, we're, we're trying to go much deeper than that and, and unsettle the roots going all the way back to Buckley because that's where we feel like things really got off track. So let's just briefly turn to uh, the language of the For Our Freedom Amendment. Um, so we can talk a little bit about how some of the problems are, are being addressed by um, our solution. So section one is where we lay out a set of what we're calling compelling sovereign interests. So off the bat, we're, we're saying as a matter of, of constitutional principle that there are more compelling interests than just the prevention of quid pro quo corruption. We have compelling interests in representative self-government, in federalism, in the integrity of our electoral processes, and in the political equality of natural persons. And um, including the political equality uh, directly undercuts what Buckley said about the idea of um, equalizing the playing field is anathema to the, to the First Amendment. This is saying actually uh, political equality and striving toward that is a core principle of our constitutional republic. Um, so we've got those new compelling sovereign interests, but they're only new in the sense that you know, we're putting them all in this one place. But these are also already woven into the structure of the constitution. Um, as a matter of text and history, we're just kind of putting them in one place and, and saying, listen, like we the people are declaring, we disagree with what the court's been saying. Uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Does natural, natural persons, does natural have a key function there? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so I, I didn't include uh, the language in one of Justice Rehnquist's dissent, but he actually, he's, um, he was drawing the distinction between natural persons and corporations and unions. Natural persons really means uh, humans and not legal persons. And legal persons can be corporations, unions, 501c4s, all of that. So we're really talking about human beings. Why did we write that? Um, the reason why we didn't 
right the political equality of human beings is because in the cases there has been there's been this assertion that corporations are people and there are other contexts in which I don't want to get too far down this path but in which personhood uh, has been a useful concept for non-human non entities and so we wanted to just say we're talking about natural persons in this particular provision. All right, so section two, I like to think of dejudicializing the whole domain of campaign finance. Um, we're, what we're really trying to say is, listen, Supreme Court, we don't think it makes sense for you to be the nation's regulator in chief anymore, because really the Supreme Court is setting campaign finance policy. That's what they're doing. That is not a job for our Supreme Court. It's a job for us. It's a job for our elected representatives. And so we're saying nothing in this constitution shall be construed to forbid Congress or the states from reasonably regulating and limiting uh, contributions and spending in campaigns, elections, or ballot measures. Um, and it's sending uh, as clear a signal, I think, as we can that the Supreme Court should be um, deferring to reasonable regulation by the political branches. I do just want to say, some people worry about that. They worry about, uh, you know, they, they're believers in judicial review, and, and I am too. Um, but I just want to say that we're also, th by giving this power back to the political branches and the people, we're lowering the stakes of any bad regulation because that regulation from this point forward is always going to be subject to being corrected by the normal legislative process. Because if, you know, let's say, I don't know, uh, I'll say Massachusetts, because that's where I'm from. Massachusetts does something which, you know, maybe the Supreme Court thinks is pretty wild and not a good idea as a matter of policy, but they defer to it. Um, maybe Massachusetts realizes after a few years that it was a bad idea, they can change it through the political process. Uh, Senator Bennett, you got a question. Yeah, the word reasonably, Yeah, so um, as at, at the first level, we think that the, the lawmakers should be able to choose what's reasonable. Um, the, the courts would have, um, would have a role in ferreting out impermissible motives. So for example, I actually, I went back and I listened to Buckley versus Vallejo oral argument, and there was a big concern about like unfair incumbent protection um, where the thought is that maybe the lawmaking was uh, really, really self-interested and not keyed to one of the compelling sovereign interests in the, that the people have. And so courts could be looking out for that sort of a thing. Like, is the reasonable regulation tied to our compelling sovereign interests, right? Or they're not gonna defer to a regulation that is clearly just incumbents protecting themselves. And I think there, there would also be um, something that wasn't regulating the volume of money, but was more about content, right, would not be reasonable. Um, and then just briefly, I wanted to touch on section three, where this is the empowering clause where we're saying very clearly, Congress and the states shall have the power to implement this article, including uh, going down a little bit by prohibiting artificial entities from raising and spending money in campaigns, elections, or ballot measures. I just want to say we're not requiring that at all, but what we're trying to do is give maximum flexibility back to the people who should be making campaign finance policy, which is our elected officials. Yeah, so, uh, is this render null and void all previous that's a great question. The question was, does it render null and void all previous decisions? I, I like to say it radically unsettles all of those prior precedents so that they'd have to be looked at new, but that doesn't mean that all of those precedents will turn out differently. So it's not like all the cases now have the opposite outcome, but it means that if a court confronts an issue that was already decided in, let's say, Citizens United, they can't rely on Citizens United for precedent because this is brand new. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
first of all, I've, I've loved this approach to the new moment for a long time, and I'm very, by any means, the best version of the, the very topics that are out there. My one um, quibble with it, I, I think um, the word including in section three is having to do a whole lot of work on the um, various other ways that are currently being used. Um, to uh, to event corruption, particularly in lobbying, directly profiting um, uh, various things that, that happen in Congress. Um, and uh, it's not clear that all of those things would be uh, currently allowed to be regulated and legislated. And I'm wondering if um, having the word including Say that this list is not exclusive. If you think that's sufficient to um, to allow Congress to address some of those other issues, if the Supreme Court would decide that under current uh, constitutional interpretation, they would not be able to. Yeah, that's a fantastic question, and I and I want to just step back and say, um, even going back to Section One. Part of the reason that we do include some of this broader like value-based language is because we are really trying to give um, Congress and the states much more power to experiment in all of these areas that touch on our ability to self-govern. So that includes things like lobbying. It, we include the integrity of the, um, our electoral process because the, the court the court right now has been in a habit of um, deciding whether it thinks the policy choices are wise. And then once it decides a certain way, the only way to backpedal is either through a change of personnel or through a constitutional amendment. And what we're doing here is we're trying to say there should be a, a lot more flexibility for experimentation in this whole sort of domain of good governance. Um, since we're running short on time, I did want to just touch on our um, call to action, because I know we have some lawyers in the room, which is we are trying to build out our, our state-based nationwide legal network, because as you heard earlier this morning, we've got some amazing Rotarians and Chamber of Commerce folks who are effectively reaching their peers, um, and we want to do that with lawyers. So, Julie, I don't know if you wanted to say a little bit about the types of things you've been able to do as a volunteer for, for AP. Right. So one thing I did, I was able to write an op-ed article that appeared in the fulcrum describing what I just described to you about comparing France with the United States. Um, and I've been helping Brian and Jeff. They've let me sit in on some of the drafting sessions, which thank you very much. It's been very, very interesting. Um, and as a member of the Finance Council, I know a lot of times you go to lawyers, especially in big law, they really want to help, but they have no time. So, but they have money. So <laughs> we'd like to develop a fundraising network also through lawyers. So we would like to connect with lawyers in your states. And if you know any that are already involved in American Promise or come to you asking if they can help, please contact Brian who will feed them through to me, and we will get them working. And I wanted to um, touch on, I know it says up there, pro bono services, and what do we, what do we mean by mm -hmm. that? So as we gain more traction in different jurisdictions, uh, the types of activities we're doing in a state are themselves subject to different compliance and regulations. And so to have folks in that state who could say, hey, listen, like uh, I have a friend who practiced in, um, disclosure area in Pennsylvania, and they can help us out. Um, you know, we, we, have, we have lawyers who help us with that too, uh, but it's nice to not always have to pay for it. So if you, have, if you have friends or contacts that are willing to be part of the network and actually serve in that way, please let me know. And then also, lawyers are, can be, like a nice credible voice in their local community. And, um, and sometimes they can help us connect with local leaders that we wouldn't no otherwise. Um, so all of these things, you don't have to be a lawyer to join our legal network. Um, but if you know any that part of your family who you think you'd want to recommend, please, my email address is pretty easy to remember. It's just Brian, B-R-I-A-N-B, Brian B, at AmericanPromise.net. Um, I did want to leave some time for more questions. And we, we actually got a, ahead of time, 
we got a question, um, which I which I want to read and um, address, and we might get some some conversation going. So the question is that um, she's heard about the myth of the runaway convention, um, and uh, which is about this idea that there may be a constitutional convention and that could get out of control. And she wants to know how can she best redirect and correct this in conversation. So I'll just back up for a second and say, um, there obviously there are two paths for an amendment to be uh, ratified. And one of those paths would involve proposal and ratification. Well, proposal by a convention of states, uh, and you need two thirds of the states, and then ratification by three fourths of the states. And although American Promise is pursuing the other path for various reasons, we believe that uh, getting people practiced in what I call constitutional politics is a good thing right now. And I, some people uh, may may disagree with me, but I think like even even people who are on one far extreme, but who are willing to say, hey, listen, th these are constitution level problems and that we're feeling. Like, I think it's good as citizens to say, yeah, you know what? Like, maybe we do need to look at this stuff. So although it's not our strategy, I think it can be a helpful piece of the conversation. Uh, and you had a question or a comment? My area. Yeah. We are not We are share the same goal as American Congress. And we are using the Article 5 Convention strategy. If you are interested in learning more about that or working with us on that, you can email me at sam at wolfpatchcon.com or just go to wolfpatchcon.com slash there. And I'm not going to talk about it extensively, although I very easily could. A hundred percent of the peer reviewed legal resources on the matter uh, back up the, the fact. Uh, literally 100%. Uh, back up the fact that there's no way a new limited Article 5 convention call could possibly be determined on any of the topics. This is why the Massachusetts Citizens Commission, among you know, three representatives from there in the room uh, right now, uh, unanimously supported that method as well as the method that American Congress is doing. It's really important to have all paths to litigation. Uh, Bill. Yeah, uh, Brian. Uh, so a question that was debated for a good six months in the Massachusetts Citizens Commission was what amendments are sustained. Basically it's a bit of an off of the section break, you know, the issue of the you know, national portions of our original entities. You combine them all into what amendments are sustained. When I understand your rationale as by what amendment are sustained. Yeah, so um, my recollection was that the second, I'll go back to section three too. So my recollection was that the second, the other amendment being debated by the commission uh, dealt with corporate personhood more generally. Whereas this section, we are, we are including it, uh, but sort of in the very specific context of campaign finance, uh, good government stuff. So we're not, um, we're not trying to like end corporate personhood, period, like for all purposes. And um, yes, yeah. So is section three really needed? I mean, if you get to section one, it's section two. Um, well, section sec we do think section three is needed because although this says nothing should be construed to forbid Congress or the states from regulating, um, so many of the other clauses in the Constitution that vest power in specific areas do have what they, you know, the, the vesting, like shall have the power. And so we just didn't want there to be any question that they've got it. Um, and I, you had a question too, I wanted to make sure. Oh, yeah, uh, I know this is primarily about the money, but, uh, and I think it's maybe a section two thing, but can you give an example of how it would work if you know this whole, in the news, all these red states, are trying to change their election systems. Um, so uh, they're distorted all, you know, anyway, I don't want to watch my words here. <clears throat> I'm just wondering how that would be tested. First of all, the, uh, the, this amendment would have to be in place, but would that, would that fall under the, the amendment? I, you know, I think it was under the, the election process. I mean, if, if oh, we, yeah. You know Integrity. Yeah, I do. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question and, um, I do just want to. I do just want to note that that whole topic 
there are several other provisions in the Constitution that touch on regulation of elections in the states. And so what we're trying to do is we're not trying to change that status quo in those other provisions, but we are kind of highlighting the values that we think should be relevant when states are doing different things. So, you know, I, I can't think of a hypothetical off the top of my head, but there may be some measure that a state took that, that you could not say in good faith was advancing the integrity of its electoral process. I don't know what it would be, but like if they said, oh, you know what, we wanna, we wanna have unlimited amounts of foreign money and we wanna limit in-state money to you know 50 bucks a person, like that probably is not advancing the integrity of the electoral process of that state. Um, but we're, we're not trying to change any of the other. It, it just came up yeah. for me because um, I've never really been a huge fan of federalism. I, I may have called it <laughs> um, And so, but I, I like it in this, you know, uh, for the purposes of, you know, we're trying to serve here. Yeah. But I, I, I want to see what, you know, how it might have other problematic effects. So you're saying. No, we should, and we can we can keep chatting because I will say like there have been other people that kind of raised that note of caution about federalism, and and I think in this context it's actually it's something every American can kind of get behind. So, yeah, yeah. and certainly the funding of those efforts would be could be addressed by legislation, so that if it would have to be a genuine initiative for a broad range of people rather than moneyed interests. Yeah. Well, we are out of time, but I want to thank you all. And I want to also just put in a plug, which is that we've got a break right now. It's um, 4 o'clock. Please make sure you're back here by 425, because you don't want to miss Andrew Yang. Um, so anyway, thank you all for coming. Really, really great to see you. Thank you.